when when he was born, it was sort of like my world stopped. I mean, partly because of the stuff you're talking about, the sort of the social stigma and the challenges of living with a disability and the way people judge you and the way we sweep it under the rug. I didn't know anything about this, right? I didn't know anything about disability. Certainly didn't know anything about prosthetics. Like, like I, I have like a PhD in prosthetics now. When I think about how we raised Ez, like we kind of punched through that. We just said, this is, we're gonna put him out front. Hi, I'm Chris Whiteout. Welcome to Living It, the podcast where we join experts in the experience of being human. Be bold, say yes to adventure, say yes to living it. Welcome to Chris Whiteout, Living It, where we talk with experts in the experience of being human, those people who've taken the risk to realize their dreams. Today, we have Clayton Freck, who is the CEO and founder and career coach at Ampla Institute. He's also the founder and CEO of Angel City Sports. He also has a son who is competing in the Paralympics, his son, Ezra. Clayton, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. This is fun. Now, I also, I didn't mention in your introduction that your wife was in the movie Crash. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> that was a long time ago, but it was one of those movies that stuck with me. Yeah. And so in anticipation of our conversation, I went back on the airplane and I watched Crash. No way. I did. It was it which was great. And one of the things that was so cool and especially appropriate for our conversation was Don Cheadle's basically opening of the movie where he said, it's the sense of touch in any real city you walk, you know, mm-hmm. you brush past people, people bump into you in LA, nobody touches you. We're always behind this metal and glass. I think we miss that touch so much that we crash into each other just so we can feel something. Obviously, the movie was so much about race. It was about socioeconomic issues, but it speaks so much to what we're talking about within the disability community as well. I often say that that from the time we're little, we're taught not to stare at someone who looks different. And as a result, 1.2 billion people in the world are effectively invisible. Mm. And it's we're behind that glass. We're behind that metal. We actually are invisible. But so much of what you're doing is giving people a way to crash into each other. Both the athletes, different groups, different socioeconomic groups, different races, but then also the Hollywood world, the professional sports world, to bring people into a world together where they actually get a sense of touch. I know that Crash came out the year before Ezra was born, where there was a bit of a transformational pivot within your lives. But does that speak to who you are as a person and the and the goals that you have? First of all, Ezra was in almost delivered on the red carpet at the crash premiere. So there's pictures of my wife Bahar in this really beautiful, like blue and pink and purple flowy dress at the crash premiere, and she's bursting. And in fact, our hospital bag, right? That like okay, if it's go time, you just grab the bag, is in the trunk of the limo, right? (laughs) Like we packed for the hospital (laughs) the night of the red carpet. Um, And it made for quite a scene, right, on the the red carpet. Um, So back to the movie and kind of its, right, kind of connectivity to to our world. Um, I think there is a connection. I mean, here's you know, when we read the script, so I was like Bahar's script reader, right? I would like read everything and then kind of like, okay, I, I, I like this one or I don't like this one, but you should still read it. And like, this one's terrible. Don't read this one. Don't waste your time. Cause her energy, especially in those early days was like auditions, like one audition took like eight hours of time of prep and all this stuff. And, and you know, like it's a lot of work. And so I just would take the reading part, right? And sort of like give her a little, and I read that script and I was like, best script I've read. Like I've been reading a lot of script for the last couple of years. 
you know, working with, you know, supporting her. And I was like, holy cow, you know? And so we kind of fell in love with the script and it wasn't a big studio movie. It was independent, you know? Um, uh, they paid all the actors scale. I mean, a couple of the folks got some back end, I think on it, but like, you know, it was, everyone was in it for the kind of for the social impact, right? Uh, and so, yeah, that really resonated, right, with us right away, right? Because you had a movie attempting to portray, right, humanity in this, I think, fairly real light of like, okay, we all have something we're hiding. We all have some dark stuff over here, but then we also do good things over here. And, right, we're, right, and, um and, you know, Bahar grew up in L.A., uh, immigrated here as a little girl, and uh, I've been in L.A. since the early 90s. And so we have a love for this place, but then also we can look at it like with a critical eye. And I think the movie, in a crazy way, kind of accurately portrayed what, what life was out there, but we all didn't believe it right? when that movie came out. <laughs> oh, this is sensationalized. This isn't life. This isn't reality. But, you know, we look back on the Me Too and the George Floyd movement and the Asian hate movement, like all this stuff. It's like, well, okay, we that movie was not too far off. No, and one of the things too, I think as the viewer, you, you know, we, we're sort of like, I mean, I grew up on Disney, right? So it's white hats, black hats kind of thing. Like you want to know who you're supposed to root for. And in that movie, they kept twisting it on us too, right? Okay, that's the good guy. That's the bad guy. And it's like, you know, or, or, fact, one or, or whatever. You could argue Bahar's character, uh, for those that haven't seen the movie, see it because it's a really good film, but she plays the store owner's daughter, right? And uh, her character is one of the few characters that actually don't, you don't see the negative, right? You don't see a dark side to her character. She's a real angel for her father. Exactly. And she was, she was, she was the daughter, but then she was also a medical professional. Yes. 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 And so in, in terms of sort of that second generation or first generation to grow up in the country, she was that success story. She's actually, a, I think a coroner. So she's like an MD, you know, like highly educated, but does she, the, so you, right. You figure out she's somehow bought blanks. Does she buy them on purpose or does she buy them by accident? You're asking me that, having watched the movie? Yeah, you just saw it. I know, I know. It's a, it's a good question because it seemed like she was just so fed up with the guy who was selling her the gun. And she's like, yes, give me the red ones. And and you know what? I mean, we didn't see the red ones. Obviously, we, we weren't able to read what, what was on them. But red sounds like, I mean, even though it's a stop sign, red in the context of, of a gun sounds like, something that's really serious as opposed to a blank. So they reveal their blanks uh, very quickly, right? right. So oh yeah. Open. So you see that they're blanks, but on purpose or by accident, what's your, what's your vote? Oh, I think it, I, 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 I would say it was, it was by accident. I, I, I did. That's most people say that. And, um, but she, because she's a coroner and the way she loads the gun, she like really knows what she's doing. So she actually, it's intentional. That is interesting. Yeah, she's, 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 you know, she's not in law enforcement. And this, well, I mean, coroner might be right. I mean, I don't know exactly where coroners are, but like she, she knows what she's doing. No, no, I saw that, that that's true. So that, so the, you, you saw that part of it. And, and so, so it's more of a deterrent. Yes. She doesn't trust her father. Yeah. She doesn't she doesn't trust her father. But at the same time, if you introduce, I've always thought if you introduce something into a situation, you better be prepared to use it. Sure. Yep. Which prevents her father from using it, which might be a good thing, which obviously was a good thing in the movie. And one of those moments where you're just like, oh man, I can't believe. I get chills every time I see the scene where he shoots the the you know the the locksmith's daughter. Every time, like it's it's the best scene. It's so powerful. Oh, oh, it was it was amazing. So so anyway, we're talking about the movie, but the movie, I mean, the movie does so much of what I feel like I'm trying to do within within our community. You know, to be able to see the individual, 
mm-hmm. past the mm-hmm. you know past the first impression past the 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 thought of oh this person is this this person is that to actually be able to get that get to know and and allow yourself to be surprised yeah is that something i mean obviously some of this was the education was foisted on you with with Ezra sure where you know he he was born missing missing a limb and some fingers and and so then all of a sudden you came into a totally different world that you had no idea about when when he was born it was sort of like my world stopped i mean partly because of the stuff you're talking about the sort of the social stigma and the challenges of living with the disability and the way people judge you and the way we sweep it under the rug i didn't know anything about this right i didn't know anything about disability i i had hardly even spoken to someone in a wheelchair right my entire life um certainly didn't know anything about prosthetics. Like, like I, I have like a PhD in prosthetics now. Um, but like, yeah, it, it, like literally just the world, the world stopped. Right. Uh, and I like to say like, I was just blind to disability. Like clearly it was everywhere. Right. But man, I was not paying attention to it. And, you know, as you think about, well, how, how is this child then going to navigate this world? Right. Uh, Bahar and I really realized like early on, like, okay, this movement needs a lot more people to sort of lean in, right? Disability needs a lot more advocates and allies and influencers and right media attention and all this stuff, which is why what you do is so amazing um, because nobody knows anything about this world. And we sort of have chosen to like, ugh, it's awkward, it's tough, it's hard to look at or whatever, right? I mean, like you kind of come up with a million reasons why it should just be stuck in a corner. Um, and so we sort of, when I think about how we raised Ez, like we kind of punched through that. We just said, this is, we're gonna put him out front, right? And never put pants on the kid. <laughs> like kid doesn't even, I mean, he wears pants now here and there, but like, mostly it's like team usa gear like like he doesn't wear pants like it's just so funny and like we're just gonna put him out in front and and when you do that and you start having that conversation right because it 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 creates friction it creates right like dissonance for a lot of people out there that aren't comfortable with it or just curious once you have that conversation we're all just human beings it's no big deal right and um I think that's, it was our mission at a real micro level earlier in his career or in his life career. Hard to, hard to separate the two. I, I know, right? It's like, you know, um, but like early days, right? It was like, okay, the kid's in his class, right? The kid's at, on his basketball team, teachers at his school, camp counselors, did it, right? It was like, let me just like address it right away, right? Put it out there, educate people, take the temperature down, and let him just be a kid. And now we get to think more kind of along your lines. Like, okay, so how do we move the needle for society, right? How do we use this platform that he's building, right? That we have with Angel City Sports uh, to sort of move the needle. So like at our events at Angel City events, like we're including non-disabled people to participate. And, you know, that's not something that most adaptive sports programs are doing out there. Um, but I think it's a really critical strategy, right? Because now, back to crash, you get to bump in together playing wheelchair basketball. Hey, level playing field. You're all in a chair now. Or, or not so level playing or field. Or not so level, yeah. <laughs> Since the able-bodied people aren't getting around in a chair, so they don't have the chair skills. Even better. <laughs> For one day, right? The, the scale is tipped. <laughs> Well, well, it is, and it, and it is that sense of appreciation, and it is the sense of an expertise. Yeah. yeah. And, and we as human beings develop expertise. It's what we do. I mean, it's obviously what you do as part of your profession. But one of the things you did with, with Ezra was, was a sense of scripting, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so scripting, figuring out what is the message, which makes perfect sense. Like, I mean, you do that with kids anyway, right? I mean, like trying to, because they don't necessarily have the verbal skills. So it's like, I'm playing with this truck right now. 
I, I will I will give it to you when I'm done playing with the truck where they don't necessarily have that ability to to figure out how to how to negotiate these things there on their own. But you and your wife didn't necessarily know everything. You were learning as you were helping Ezra to script his life. What was that process like? Because you also you went through a mourning period. I'll share the morning process with you and then uh, and then we'll talk about the script concept because I think for, especially for any parents of a child, not necessarily has a disability, but has something that's obviously different about them that is easy to perceive by others, right? I think there's a real power in scripting. Um, but yeah, so my, you know, my sort of, my journey that led me into the adaptive sports world was, uh, I thought being a dad meant being physically active with kids, right? I just thought like, that's what my dad did. Um, you know, we, we hiked, we sailed, we, we were at the beach every weekend. Um, you know, we, I was always in sports. He's not like an amazing athlete, but like I played squash with him and, if, you know, did a few things with him. Um, we skied my whole life with him. I still ski with my dad, you know, it's amazing. Um, and so when Ez was born, I didn't understand sports were possible for people with disabilities, right? So I just didn't, my brain hadn't like connected the dots. It didn't understand this. And so I thought that being a dad, of being a good dad had been taken away from me. And so, I mean, it just sounds so silly now looking back, but it just was like, it was just ignorance, right? It was just lack of education. So I spent a summer, I call it my sad summer. So I, I'm a surfer, uh, just surfed this morning. Um, and I would go surf and just cry like cry about my loss, right? And it's the best place to cry because no one knows you're crying in the water. It's like so brilliant. Like no one teaches you that, but I'm teaching you now. It's amazing, right? Go to the pool and just cry. Like no one knows. So, um, and surfers don't care about, right? They're like in their own zone too. So they don't even know what's going on, right? I could be, you know, attacked by a shark and they wouldn't care. But um, uh, as long as the surf's good, you know, they're focused, but the, I, it, what happened for me, right. When you sort of slide, you bottom out and there's nowhere to go, but up. And I started just Googling, right. This is like, you know, so we had Google 2005 and uh, found a few organizations doing amputee surfing. So that was like my thing. I was all, oh, I always wanted to surf with my kids. Right. Um, and I found amputee surfers out there. Right. And, um, and I, went to the Challenge Athletes Foundation triathlon weekend and spent the whole weekend with this amputee surfer from Brazil, Pirata, which is the pirate. Uh, he made his first leg out of wood because he didn't have money. And um, just the crazy story, but he rips, such a good surfer, right? And so Pirata changed my entire mindset. And so I set out to become an expert in everything adaptive and Paralympic sports. Like that just was like, okay, this is possible. And I'm going to learn everything out there. I'm going to go to every event. I'm going to learn all the sports. I'm going to meet all the leaders. I'm going to really figure this movement out. And so that's what I've been doing for 17 years. Like that's all I've been, that's like been my like passion, my mission. Um, and it's and your led, job in a lot of ways as, as the father, right? It's led me down all these paths, but um, I just, initially it was to stay ahead of Ezra, right? As a parent, I mean, you can't predict exactly what your parent, kids are going to get into and what path, but like if you, the, to the extent you can stay ahead of them a little bit, right, um, it's really good. And so I just was trying to stay ahead of him, right, and kind of led us down this, this crazy path. And now he goes to the Tokyo Paralympics as a 16-year-old, and, you know, he's got a pretty long, long career ahead of him, I think. Right. It's going to be a lot harder for him to stay or for you to stay ahead of him. Yeah. I mean, I, I try, but yeah, it's, it's just much harder now. <laughs> we'll get into the scripting part, but yeah. Was it important for you to have gone through your, your sad summer, your, your summer of crying? Would you, if, if you yeah. look back on it and you said to somebody, you don't need to go through that, or did you need to go through that? I think I needed to go through it in order for me to find my path and understand that it's not necessary, right? And so now having a platform to sort of do something about that, 
Um, I'm pretty Angel City sports in general, but we're pretty passionate about finding new athletes, right? And moving them into the system. And so I believe in my heart, we got to get to you real fast, right? Because we got in the hospital before we got out of the hospital when Ezra was born, we got all this great medical advice. We had, we had a, a game plan, right? We knew more or less the surgery we needed to do. We knew when to do it. We kind of thought we had a, who to do it with. We ended up switching docs, but it, that's a whole other podcast. But, um, you know, like we had kind of a, a prescription of life, right? Like boom, boom, boom. And, but dang, nobody said anything about sport nobody nobody because they didn't know we walked out of the hospital and i we were listening we were paying i remember everything those doctors told us right from in the hospital those were really important couple days for us right set up so much of our journey but man they missed sport completely and i was ready to listen right i was ready to listen and i didn't get it then so i think like looking back now I have an opportunity to kind of address that, right? And, and reduce the sad period, or I call it the dark period for most people, right? Because you get depressed, right? You acquire disability and life is tough now. And everything you thought you could do in life maybe isn't the same and it's hard and blah, 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 right? So that's what I'm really passionate about. I think that sports is not the cure-all for everybody's ills, but it's a darn good start, right? <laughs> like. You nailed it in that you're talking about the passion part of it. And and passion doesn't necessarily have to be sport. It can be something else. But the flip side, that what you were thinking about, I mean, I, from what you're saying, is that, and I know that I went through this when I left the hospital, is that it feels clinical. Mm -hmm. It, it mm -hmm. feels like, you know, I mean, I, I felt like I came out of the hospital thinking, okay, I have to do everything I can not to get a pressure sore. I have to make sure to do a pressure relief every 15 minutes. And, and you feel like in some ways you can only get sick. You can only get mm -hmm. hurt. Whereas the passion part of it, whether it's sport or whether it's something else, is you can only get better. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, when I talk to... I mean, you know me, I'm, I'm a, I chase people down on the street and talk to whoever I can run into, right? Uh, airports, I mean, you name it. Um, and I do think that the medical community gets sport wrong, right? If they even get it at all, but they just don't really understand it. And so I think what, the, what our, I call them all athletes, right? If you have a disability, you're one of our athletes or a target athlete at least. Um, but they know what they're not supposed to do. They know what's not possible. They know all of the no's, right? The doors that have closed on them. Pretty clear about that coming out of the hospital. And I got it, okay, uh, yeah. But like, well, what doors have opened, right? So that's to me the missing piece, right? When you move people through the medical system, where are the social workers? Where are the nurses? Where are the doctors? What are they telling these patients about what's now possible in their lives? Because doors have opened, right? I would never have met you. Right. I would have never met, I mean, like I'm a part of the most amazing community of human beings on this planet, people with disabilities, mm -hmm. hands down. I wouldn't trade this journey for anything. This community is warm and loving and empathetic and accepting and literally nobody cares gender, race, ink, like we don't care about that at all. We're just curious about your disability. Like we don't care about any of that other stuff, right? Where else does that exist? It's the coolest bubble of a community and it just needs to be bigger, right? That's my thought, it just needs to grow. Well, it needs to be bigger. And this is some of what you did, I would imagine in the scripting is making it bigger. You talked about the human part of it. We're all human on some level. What 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 did that first one and a half page script look like? I have it on my computer. I can pull it up. So so the script. So listen, we don't like Bahar and I don't really. We shouldn't be taking credit for any of the ideas. We literally just listen to people that are smarter than us and like package them. So this came from a child development specialist, right? Um, Betsy Brown Brown uh, and. 
it was her idea, like, hey, write a script, send it to all the parents, right, ahead of kindergarten, send it to all the administrators and the teachers, and, like, educate everybody, right? Educate everybody ahead of Ezra's arrival. And so we've just started doing that when he was little, right? Like, even before kindergarten, he was, like, playing basketball at the Y, and we do it there. Like, everybody got this script, right? And the script was pretty simple, but it explained his condition, explained how he was born, um, and it, it, what I like about the script is it like do's and don'ts, right? It was like, this is the language we're using. This is the language we don't want you to use. And if you use it, we might call you out on it, right? If we hear it, we're going to like say something, just like a little polite warning, but like, this is what happened. It's no big deal. Treat him normally, you know, and sort of a couple do's and don'ts. So it really wasn't even that long. It was actually a page and a half, I think exactly. Um, and so so many amazing things come from this, right? The simple idea, right? First of all, we have to own what happened. Sure. You put something on paper in a memo, in a letter, and you start blasting it out, you, it starts the ex, ex self-acceptance, right? It starts that journey for uh, mostly Bahar and I, right? As parents. Um, then we all use the same words when we talk about this child, right? And so in those early years, the child is just listening. The child doesn't advocate for themselves. But when you're a little guy and you hear the same words explaining your disability hundreds, maybe thousands of times, by the time you're five, you're ready to use those words. They're so ingrained. And so, and it's done in a matter of fact way. You take the emotion out of it. And so as can talk about his disability with anybody, any situation, and it's no big deal, right? And so over time, it helps him with self-acceptance, right? So I, in a weird way, the benefits of the script are actually for the person with a disability, right? Yeah, we all benefit by learning a little bit or whatever, but like you wanna raise a confident child who happens to be somehow different than everyone else, to me, this is so important. And you get this wrong, if they're not hearing the language over and over again to, to become their own advocate, well, when are they gonna advocate for themselves then? When are they gonna figure that out? In junior high, high school? When everything's crazy, yeah. Right, you're hiding differences in those years. But if you can do this early days, by the time you get into that, right, those awkward years. So you get the script and you get what's different in some ways out front and, and you get it into an understandable manner yeah and you're able to move beyond that to what you share in common what's in common i mean i hate to say it right because i don't think that everyone shouldn't feel this burden to have to come clean on what their disadvantage is right out of the gates right Right. That's like kind of like an unfair, like, right, sort of thing to burden people with disabilities on. But for kids, it's really helpful. Right. Um, so, again, I don't know that it like applies to everything, but like for us, because it's so obvious, if you're in a chair or you have CP or this or that or you're blind or whatever, like people are going to be really curious. And maybe over time, society, right, mellows and, and, and this isn't like a strategy that is useful anymore. But um, I'm going to tell you one quick Hollywood story um, that's really related to this. So um, after Crash comes out, Bahar gets um, a role in Mission Impossible 3. You know, there's not a lot of negotiating, right? You know, the Paramount's like, you want to be in a Tom Cruise movie or not? Like, <laughs> you, know, you just tell us, right? <laughs> and we actually took her first class ticket to Italy and we turned it into two coach tickets so I could go as the, the nanny, right? Because we had little Ezra and he's like a couple months old. It's like the first summer of his life. And, um, and so I'm just carrying him around the set, right? And um, I letting him watch, right? His head's out. He's sort of seeing what's going on. And, and I got one leg that's laying, coming down and the other leg that's curved, right? And, and it's just out, right? And you know, people would come up and like, oh, his legs curved. And they try to like pull his legs. Like it was crazy. People would do all kinds of crazy stuff. And so I learned on the set of Mission Impossible 3, sort of this script lesson, right? Which is, I got to just tell people. 
I can't wait for them to figure it out on their own because it's different. They don't understand what they're seeing. Their brain can't even calculate. Like, how does a baby have a leg that's curved that's not, right? Like, it doesn't make sense. And so I would just, I just learned. I just thought, like, oh my God, I'm just going to introduce Ezra. I'm like, hey, this is Ezra, you know? Um, and he was born with a different leg. You can see it's curved. And oh my gosh, like my, like, and my stress level, right? It came down so much. Because when I'm waiting for society to react to him, oh, you don't know what you're going to get, right? There's like the weirdest comments and the looks and this, and it's like emotionally exhausting, right? Which probably is something that everyone with disability can relate to, right? Exhausting. So again, sucks to put that pressure right on the, on the person to like be so open about it. But man, it really helped. It helped me as a dad. You know, it's one of those things that if you're having a conversation with someone, if you can lower the stress level, your stress level, their stress level, you can actually connect yeah. as opposed to it kind of pushes you away. Talking about the script thing, you have two other sons mm -hmm. as well. Did you utilize the script method with your younger sons too? No, I mean, they, they, they don't have anything that's, obvious right um you know that sort of caught brought draws attention or anything um but you know they're pretty versed in the script um you know they they, they know the story you know the well not necessarily Ezra's story but their story you know in some ways it's almost like Ezra was so prepared for a conversation true because he had this script and he had a need for the script but he was prepared for the conversation Whereas oftentimes as people, we're not necessarily as prepared for the conversation because we're like, well, what's important? I yeah. don't know what's important. I, I think the harder thing for the other two is even if you take Ezra's career and sort of, you know, kind of celebrity status out of the equation, you just say, okay, I have a, three kids and one has disability and two don't disability requires a lot of energy and resources right and so if you're younger and you're kind of evaluating right the parental allocation of resources you don't feel like you're getting your share because you're not there's no way to give an equal share when you have a disability it's very time consuming right um you know, it used to be sort of surgeries and medical stuff and, and it's still, and then just like the social emotional side of it. And now, now it's more like logistical stuff, right? With the prosthetic, but it's never ending. It's not a solved thing. It's the thing that continues. Right? So I think that's the real challenge. And, you know, Bahar and I work on this um, all the time, right? Of just trying to share the resources and Ezra's older. So it's nice. So now, he's understands this right and he's spending more time with his brothers um and you know kind of supporting them in their journeys um and so uh it's you know i think it's the balance feels different now because he's able to kind of contribute as almost like another adult in the family but um but super tricky and i think you see a lot of families divorce right with disability um whether it's at birth or acquired, right? Like it, it really puts a lot of stress on the family unit. Um, but I'm really, I mean, I'm really grateful. My younger guys are, are pretty awesome in their own right. Um, they're all really, they're good public speakers and they're confident. And so they have, they've been able to sort of develop a lot of the same characteristics that, that Ezra has. How much has your business life helped inform what you're doing with Ezra, with your kids, with Angel City Sports. I mean, looking at it, talking about talking about being being a major exec for 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 a company uh, as as trying to affect a cultural change. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to affect a cultural change within a company, which is a hard thing to do. But you're trying to you're like with what you're doing with Angel City Sports you're trying to affect a worldwide cultural change. Yeah, no, that's a really good, it's a really good question. So yeah, so my, I mean, I have a kind of a crazy background. So early days, I was, I was really interested in academia. 
uh, and did a few years of research for a professor at UCSB. And then your father was an economist, right? Yeah, yeah. Did like environmental economics research for the, the United Nations and EPA, and then and then went into government and worked for the EPA uh, and interned in the White House in environmental policy too in undergrad. So I kind of had this like academic kind of government path. And then I went to business school and was just climbing the corporate ladder for a really long time. And then I started Angel City, right? The nonprofit. So I could kind of like done all these things, but I do think that having a strong business background, having, you know, kind of being cut from the MBA cloth, I think it gives me a couple things, right? I think very analytically and strategically. And so um, I don't, I'm not comfortable with just seeing a problem. I want to understand why, right? What is driving that problem? And what are some solutions that we can try to sort of alleviate the problem? I also just am real ambitious, right? Like I've lived under bosses and ownership groups, private equity firms, et cetera, that literally every year you have to grow, grow, grow. You grow or you die, right? You grow or you're fired. It's just so simple in the business world. You grow or you literally lose your job, right? Maintaining is never acceptable, right? Um, you're literally just, right, signing your papers to find the exit door, right? If you can't grow whatever you've got. And so I have that mentality now in the nonprofit space and in the sort of social impact space. So it's tricky because everyone doesn't have that same mentality, but like, I'm really ambitious um, and strategic. And so I think that's what I get from that business, uh, you know, experience, which is, and also like, I'm kind of fearless. Like I'll, I'm comfortable in the executive suite. I'm comfortable knocking on, on doors of anyone, um, you know? Uh, so that's, that's good. I'm probably, you know, you know, maybe too confident at times, um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm like kind of fearless, right? And it's like, I, and it's not for me, it's for this amazing community that needs, in, you know, powerful, influential people and companies to actually care about, right? So it's sort of an easy, to me, it's an easy pitch. It doesn't always work, but it's easy to make the pitch. No, it's an easy pitch, but it's interesting what you're talking about too, because you're talking about, you know, sales or whatever, which are easy to quantify. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A, a cultural change is, is far more elusive to quantify, but you're also, you mentioned what effectively comes down to me as, as your purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for a far bigger group, which makes that, that pitch that much easier Yeah, uh, because it's not just about you. But looking at that, I mean, it's it's kind of an interesting because I'd imagine you're taking that out of, you know, sort of the consulting that you're doing worth working with executives, getting to purpose sounds like something that makes perfect sense. You know, like what's your purpose? You know, it's not always nearly as obvious as we all think it should be. I think that's right. And purpose is uh, it's a really intimidating word for most people. It really is like it. it I mean, when I work with clients, like it, it's the thing they're afraid of, right? And I have to dig and look for it. And, you know, for me, I've done a lot of this kind of work, right? Looking back and looking at my career and trying to understand, like, what do I really, really care about? And for me, it's belonging. What do you mean by that? I have struggled to feel like I belonged my whole life i've moved so much and i've changed careers and i'm just like i've always had my bag packed right and so i'm always the person from another industry or i'm the kid from you know the east coast and then uh, then i was the kid that was from the west coast and then back you know like i just moved my whole life um my younger younger years especially right first 30 i was literally just moving constantly uh, I had never lived anywhere for more than a few years. And so, uh, and sport saved my butt, right? Because uh, I was a good athlete growing up. And so uh, at a couple big moves, uh, moving for fifth grade from West to East Coast and then moving for 10th grade, not a good year to move, uh, right? <laughs> like you move for ninth grade, not 10th grade, back to the West Coast. So like constantly like, 
right? Trying to figure out social situations and, and find my way. And so I think when I stumbled on disability, it like, it finally made sense my journey, right? Like it made sense of my life um, because this community doesn't feel like it belongs anywhere. Anywhere, right? Buildings, movie theaters, Blah, blah, I mean, name it. This like this doesn't feel like you belong because you're always the one guy in a chair, or as was the one guy in a leg. Like you just never feel like you belong. Um, and you know, again, sports isn't everything, but sports saved my butt, right? In a few key moments. And I think for our community, being physically active is the one thing that looks daunting and is very challenging, right? Compared to other basic things you can do in life. And so it is a place where we create that sense of belonging. And so we use that word, right, a lot. And honestly, if you can achieve that, there's so many places you can go strategically, right, with a community, um, but that's everything, right? That's the foundation. Um, and so that really speaks to my soul, it speaks to my purpose. Um, and when I unpack a lot of the things that I've done somewhat in my career but also separate from the career like on the side like you know boards and community service things that i've done aside it's actually kind of that that's the thread right that flows through a lot of things that i've done in my life um so i don't know like it's weird to say that right that the middle-aged white guy doesn't feel like he belonged in society but it's just my honest truth like i just never you know i never had that grounded feeling um really my first 30 years which is an interesting thing too because i think that for a lot of us it's it's really easy to feel like an outsider mm. you know as, as somebody with a disability in some ways it's almost like we started off talking about race and so socioeconomic groups and stuff like that disability is almost one of those things that that separates you from some of the essential parts you know the the race part the the socioeconomic group the whatever it is like those things that are that are sort of the labels that a lot of people wear it's like you kind of wear that but this one supersedes all the other ones <laughs> and what's interesting too is that we as human beings though you know i think this feeling of being a, a belonging we see it in other people but we don't necessarily feel it as much ourselves and then you're talking about the sport part mm. where you become essential mm. you become you, you have something to offer and and i've seen it on on my side you know like it's the thing that we share right as opposed to we share the mountain when we're out there skiing we share the objective we share what we're trying to do ezra's kind of grown up with this purpose and and and, and in some ways you know, someone could ask the question, is that an adopted purpose? You know, because because you guys had the you guys had the words for it. He kind of grew into it, but it seems like he has really embraced that purpose of affecting a greater change, of educating, yeah. but also also helping to demonstrate. I keep going back. One of the things for me is the human journey part of it demonstrating what it means to be in this human journey. How has Ezra gone? How has he adopted this, this sense of purpose? Because you guys effectively, you're, you're co-founders of Angel City Sports. How does he feel like he... Well, well to start with, you know, his name means uh, the helper, the teacher. So when he was born, we had a few names that we liked. And after we realized he was had a disability, we're like, okay, so uh, didn't know he would, you know, go on to go to the Paralympics as a 16 year old and become this sort of motivational speaker and do all the things he's done. But we did figure he's going to teach a lot of people about disability along the way, right? He's going to impact people just in his day to day journey, not really thinking, you know, big picture and strategic but he started speaking to classes at four years old right yeah yeah yeah. he was so he's in preschool and starts going to like grade schools right to talk to classes and stuff because i mean just he's always he's been 
schools have been asking for him to speak for so long. It's like, it's just too many schools out there. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and, and you know, part, back to that script, right? When you hear your story so much, it's like, yeah, by the time he's four, he's, he's cool talking publicly about his disability and showing his different legs and stuff. And I, listen, I think that he was, I think he was born with purpose. I think we have fostered it and helped channel it, but I think he, I think he knew from day one, you know, what his, what his mission and path was. Um, he's, he's been a mentor for most of his life. Like adults seek him out if they know he's going to be somewhere adult, mostly like amputees, right. Um, that are in, newer to the journey and they come find him. He was a little kid. People are like a full grown adults are coming to like spend time with him and learn from him. And what's really fun now is, um, and you've probably seen on social media, a couple of these videos, but like he's teaching people to run above knee amputees. So this is a really hard, hard thing to learn, right? You can get yourself a running blade, but like it is so hard as an above knee amputee because this blade is just swinging on a hinge. Like, how do you land on it right? Consistently. It's, and so he knows exactly, no one's taught him how to do this. He just knows what to say. Within two to 10 minutes, he can teach virtually anyone above knee amputee to run. I, we've documented so many of them. So he's really kind of finding this real, I mean, it's very specific skill that like, it just doesn't exist really in the world. There's so few people that know how to communicate that. So it's amazing. Um, I don't feel like we taught him how to, you know, have an impact and be purposeful. I think he knew already. Interesting. How do you take this? Because obviously it's been a personal journey, but then the personal journey becomes that much bigger with mm -hmm. Angel City Sports right and and mission is is to provide you know year-round free adaptive sports opportunities for kids adults and veterans with physical disabilities or visual impairments yep so equipment coaching competitive opportunities uh how the individual can reach their full potential and unlock their dreams through music art higher education career opportunities what does what does that mission mean within community? Because community, I mean, you're talking about belonging. Yeah. So you're talking about community too. What does that mission mean within the community and variety of different communities within? I mean, you're talking about a lot of people in that area. One to one to one and a half million people with disabilities in LA County. Is that what it is? Yeah, if you use the 15% rule, you're at one and a half million in LA County alone. Uh, I like to say, you know, we're, if you expand to LA and adjacent counties, you get up to 20 million. So, right, we're, we're I mean, you got to add San Diego in there. It's not adjacent, but close, right? SoCal is about 20 million people. So that's 3 million people living with physical disabilities. So, um, yeah, the numbers are, are, are staggering. Um, I mean, again, back to like sort of the MBA mentality, right? It's like, these are just business problems, right? It's just business problems. So how do we look at this, right? This community, this sort of whatever you want to call it, right? Kind of market. And um, what are the biggest challenges, right? To access. And so we started with a competition, Angel Games, because there's nothing, there's no competitions really in the state of California. There used to be one in San Diego years ago in the nineties and it died. Um, so like solve that, right? So at least there's something. And then, uh, oh, well, no one has equipment to get started in sports, especially if you have a spinal cord injury. So, oh, okay, so let's go raise money to build that equipment inventory to loan to athletes. Um, oh, there's no other places to learn these sports. So we'll do clinics. So it's like, so kind of just like, like, you know, it's like uh, just tackling these different problems and learning and, oh, there, no one knows about these sports. Okay, so let's build an outreach plan. So we're in the hospitals and educating, doing grand rounds, right? As many hospitals as we can and um, connected to the rehab, you know, centers and all that stuff. So it's a lot of work. It's like, it's, it's kind of stressful um, at times. 
but uh, I, you know, what I can, what I can guarantee someone that doesn't know about these, right, these sports in this community, that if they show up, whether they have a disability or not, they're going to have a great time and they're going to feel like they belong, right? This is an amazing community that just needs like the spotlight on it, right? Just needs a little more attention and awareness so more people will find it. But yeah, it's it's kind of amazing. Um, and, you know, this November, uh, November 19th and 20th, we're doing our first Courage Weekend for veterans and first responders. Um, and so that community has been open they've been able to do anything we do for, you know, since we launched in 2015, but they don't show up in big numbers. And so we're hoping that by creating something just for them, we'll start to build some relationships and then get them comfortable so they can, you know, tuck into some of our other program and we do archery and air rifle and we have a wheelchair football team that's supposed to be veterans. So like, like, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot for them to do. It's more like kind of leaning into this community. So really enjoying that process of sort of planning and building relationships there. And, and again, the, the vets have a lot of opportunity and access to resources. The first responders, I think, are the ones that have been kind of left on their own. Um, so that's exciting for us to sort of lean into that, that world as well. Clayton, I feel like we're going to have to have you back. <laughs> because I feel like we've just scratched, just scratched the surface on this, but to go back to where we where we first started with this idea of giving people an opportunity to crash into each other, and and you're talking about a, a variety of different like I've done the LA Marathon mm -hmm. a few times, and there are a lot of neighborhoods that I go into that I can't read what's written on the walls of the you know so so we're talking about different different communities that are that are coming together with a common bond i mean this common bond is is one that in some ways you're trying to hide but in this becomes front and center and, and is really the thing that is connecting you and and is not only just connecting you but as a gateway to who you are mm -hmm. as an individual as a as a realized fulfilled individual and so I think we are going to have to have you back on, but thank you so much for for what you're doing and and how you're helping out such a such a wide group of people. I really appreciate it. No, thanks. We're really, you know, it's interesting you talked about the different right languages and in, in LA. I mean, you know, I don't know. There's 240 languages being spoken in LA County, and um, you know, we're really passionate about right starting to crack some of these ethnic uh, enclaves. Um, and to sort of bring adaptive sports into different parts of kind of greater LA, Southern California. So you're going to see us be in some really unique parts of town uh, as we go forward and really excited about that, you know, because adaptive sports have been kind of a upper middle class, right? Uh, endeavor. And that's not right. I mean, it's not why we, we started Angels League Sports to serve upper middle class. They'll find us, but this is, for people that don't have the means they can't buy the equipment they can't travel they can't do any of that stuff so um so yeah so we're excited about that and there's a lot of need and a lot of potential talent as we look forward to having the games both olympic and paralympic in la in 2028 too absolutely yeah where's that little kid from you know east la or south la or whatever right uh yeah. that doesn't know that they could, they could do all these sports Exactly. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to get a chance to talk to you. You got it, man. Thanks for having me, Chris. This is awesome. Thank you to all of you for tuning in. We hope that you've enjoyed it. The greatest gift you can give us is to tell your friends. Tell your friends to tune in. Tell your friends to check it out. Uh, you know, like us, follow us, and we will continue to bring you great content, great stories, and great people. We'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. Please subscribe to Chris Waddell Living It for more stories on the adaptive community, the Paralympics, artists, athletes, entrepreneurs, experts in the experience of being human. Also follow us on Spotify, Apple, Facebook, and Instagram. I look forward to seeing you next week.